So, welcome to the first episode of the filmmaking diary for avant-garde filmmaking. This is going to be extremely avant-garde, so don't expect much in terms of structure, but I will be, you know, providing some stuff you probably need for writing. Uh, first of all, we're going to be writing outside today. There's no real reason for it other than it's very nice and it makes me feel good be out in the warm sun it's not that warm it's like 51 degrees very windy so we got a sweatshirt on um, home alone today so don't have my sunglasses girlfriend took the car so we'll be riding without sunglasses but yeah 51 degrees very very sunny blue skies almost no clouds and yeah Monday about one in the afternoon. There's no reason why I'm writing now. I just finished cleaning and putting dishes away and stuff, and now I have free time, so I'm gonna write now. There's no reason why I picked this time. This is just it. If there's a time that works for you, by all means, write at the time that works for you. This just happened to be when I was first free today. So, um, I try to sit outside for, uh, I don't know, when it's nice out, when it's like summer, uh, it's not quite summer, it's still spring, but when it's summer, I usually like to sit outside in the sun for a good deal of time. Uh, 10 minutes at the absolute bare minimum, sit outside and do absolutely nothing. Just, I mean, staring at the grass, being very mindful, breathing slowly, and just calming my brain. I suffer from anxiety, and it just it's very useful for me to calm my mind and slow my thoughts down. But we're going to be writing today, and we'll be talking about conceptualizing your themes and a bunch of other writing things. So, first thing I would recommend, just for life in general, hydration. I prefer a cold glass of water to any other type of water. Uh, ice is fine. Too cold on the teeth, I think. I like it without it. But, yeah, I have my phone, just in case a phone call or anything. Uh, and my writing stuff, no reason why it's not on a laptop, no reason, I or a tablet. I just prefer to writing pen to paper. I feel I just flow better doing this to typing. And uh, uh, something to draw with. This is not necessary at by any means. This is something that I do. If it helps you, I recommend trying it. It might help. I, um, I very much... I am a doodler. I find a lot of creativity in just scratching some stuff down. And this definitely helps my creativity, kind of gets the juices flowing. So I don't always um, draw beforehand, but today my brain really, Totoro, today my brain absolutely wants to draw something. So we're gonna do that. I saw a, uh, sitting on the ground, gonna be connecting with Earth, just being very present, uh, yeah, and anyway, I was browsing Instagram and an artist I follow posted a picture, they sketched a picture of a very generic looking skeleton with its head slanted to the left, and I very much want to draw skeletons now, so I'm gonna indulge that part of my brain real quick. I'm gonna show my brain that, hey, I'm gonna give you something you want, we're gonna be creative at the same time, then we're gonna pick up some writing. Now this is unimportant, but when I'm sketching, when I'm drawing, I, I tend to prefer very aggressive lines. I like overdrawing. I just, I don't know what it is about it. I just like it. The imperfections, I think, add something. For me, I like it personally. And we're just doing a very impressionistic skeleton. Very boxy, simple shapes. I'm not the greatest artist out there. Spine. Exaggerate that. No reason, just want to. This feels right. 
And this is one of the main things I want to explain with writing. Um, there's some things that your brain will encourage and want to do. They'll say, oh, there should be a Grim Reaper playing a piano. Why? I don't know. And it doesn't necessarily need an explanation. Uh, I personally like to go into the philosophical and the like metaphorical side of my writing. So if my brain says, Reaper on a piano, I am going to look up the meanings and true definitions and symbolism of the piano and the Grim Reaper. And then I will try to combine those and try to make something that to my brain is uh, something coherent. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the audience has to have the coherency that you have. It's perfectly valid to write something that's obscure, like a Grim Reaper playing a piano. You could have a movie that is uh, a teddy bear, and the teddy bear comes to life, and he's just trying to find the baby that usually cradles him at night. And as he looks into the family room, he sees a Grim Reaper playing a piano. Why? It doesn't necessarily matter. And while that sounds very haphazardly and very chaotic, um, uh, I don't know how to explain it entirely. The This is something that I was always hung up on with uh, more art house films when I was younger. I was like, no, they just do things that don't make sense. I don't understand it. It's not necessarily that they don't get it. In some cases, unfortunately, it's that the, the artist themselves does not. Um, they just do something because they're like, this is weird. I'm going to do it. That's when I would say it's a problem and not doesn't hold validity to the story as it's a uh, it's almost an aesthetic however having said that if you're trying to reach an aesthetic and it will help you achieve the purpose that you've set then by all means but I personally think that if you can't explain something that's perfectly fine but if you're adding something for the sake of being weird or for the sake of being confusing I think then there's a problem. I think then you need to, uh, I think then you need to look at your work differently. There's not necessarily a wrong way to write something or to create a, an idea or a concept for a story, but I would say that having a groundwork, having a spine to build off of is useful. And that's why I look deeper than the surface of it's a Grim Reaper playing a piano. That's funny, that's peculiar, let's use it. I would look further into it to enhance the idea. So, see right off the bat, drawing. I drew a very exaggerated spine that's much bigger than the skeleton itself. Why did I do that? Because my brain said so. Why? Deeper explanation. So, the Reaper in the room. How do I, like, of course it can just be there for no reason other than you want it there, but why? If you can find out why your brain wants to do something, does it want to achieve a tone, an atmosphere? Is there an aesthetic reason you want that there? Is there a universe you're trying to create? Once you understand the reason for your abstract idea, you can build on it. Once you have the strange idea figured out, and you have the groundwork. You lay your concrete down, which is the base, okay? You have your Grim Reaper playing a piano. Now, why is it there? I don't know. Okay, that's perfectly fine. What does the piano symbolize? To you, the piano symbolizes a peacefulness. Okay, that's what it, my brain just told me. What does a Grim Reaper symbolize? Death. So a peaceful death in together. So it's a very calm fear of uh, the unknown or dying or the teddy bear example. The teddy bear sees a room in the middle of the night, can't find his owner. He has a very calm fear of death in this moment. Now you can build on that. Now you know what it is. Now you understand what your abstract subconscious is trying to tell you. Your subconscious is saying the idea should be this 
for these reasons. And that's dream logic. That is your subconscious telling you how something should operate with non-literal terms and a subjective terms such as a piano and a grim reaper. That is why looking deeper than the surface is important when it comes to abstract work. Because now with someone like David Lynch, a racer head as a perfect example, he will not give an example of what it is. And that is correct. That is correct. Now when the viewer watches the movie, depending on, this is the best part, depending on what the moment they're at in their life and what they're going through will translate to what the symbolism signifies to them personally on that day. Every viewing of the movie will be different if you watch it through a different lens of mood. If you're angry, happy, sad, joyous, whatever you're feeling, it will change the meaning of things for the moment. So your subconscious will be trying to fit things into a moment. This is what abstract writing is, and this is how you achieve it. Tangent over, we're getting back to the skeletons. They have very long arms with longer forearms than upper arm. I can't think of the word for up here. Can't think of the bone for it. Last night, I was reading some comics, attempting to get inspired for today, and I realized I haven't read a Spawn comic in probably over 10 years. Bought a Spawn comic the other day with a couple others. I bought Berserker. Berserker's the one that was co-written and created by Keanu Reeves. It's excellent. I cannot wait for the anime adaptation, by the way. It, it's excellent. Sublime writing and excellent, excellent flavor. Um, however, the Spawn comic was filled with errors. It has typos all over. Not so much typos as much as the word the will be there twice, like the the person said this, and things like that. And instead of saying there, it'll say that. And there's just these small errors and then choices that just don't make sense the book will split down the middle as most books do and there will be a panel dead center and the main character's face is right where the line where the spine of the book is why would you do that i'm used to reading junji ito lately and he utilizes his panel placement so well that It just doesn't make sense. It seems very, uh, I don't want to say half-assed, but it seems very, not inconsiderate. I can't think of a proper word for it. It just seems very lackadaisical to slap a panel right in the middle and distort the person's face. Um, Junji Ito, I like the effort that he puts into it. He will, there was one book I was reading, another graphic novel the other day called, oh man, it's not regenerative, it's re regression. And there was a shot of someone talking to somebody and on the book is like, the book is, I'm looking at it like this. And on this page, there's someone talking to someone. And on this one, it shows the spoiler. It's a man with bugs crawling out of every orifice on his face. If this were a Junji Ito book, it would build to it, this entire, these both pages, it would build to it. And then when you turn, the first page would be bam, the bugs in the mouth. Because it's utilization of your property. Properly utilizing your medium of art. So with filmmaking, you have such an enormous toolbox. It is borderline endless. So when you're writing, and conceptualizing your themes and such. Creating your theme, why is the Grim Reaper in the room? You find the theme of a very calm awareness of death. So there's your theme. Now you take that and you stretch it. And you say, what else can I convey a calm approach to death? How else can I convey that beyond a Grim Reaper and a piano? And as cinema, 
you have many options. It doesn't necessarily have to be a story thing. It can be visual. You could be, uh, let's see, it could be a sunny day in a cemetery. That's very much peaceful, a peaceful look at somewhat death. So um, it can be a story thing, such as a location like that. Or it can be an aesthetic thing, like the Grim Reaper and the piano. However, you have other options as well. You have music, or lack of music. How can you convey the theme that you're attempting to get across with sound? Well, how would you convey peaceful death? That's a tough one. Do you, do you have violins? Do you have no music? Do you have ticking? Somewhat of a time that's constantly keeping track, reminding that the end is on the way? How do you do that? How do you tell the audience your theme across all spectrums of your movie. Once you have your theme, your goal, in my opinion, should be attach the theme to everything and encapsulate, entomb your project with it. So I won't go into much detail, but my film, it's project title, A Clown with Depression. The name is going to change when it releases. That movie is 0% story and 100% metaphor. Nothing in that movie is reality. 100% of the movie is a meaning that is beyond what the audience is watching. So there's a scene where a clown is dancing and a mime slams a pie in his face. Very slapstick, very very comical. I have dramatic music and it's quite the contradiction. It's very amusing to me. Um, but to the common viewer, to the common audience, that's what it is. That's what the movie offers. It's a funny scene with an obscure moment of a, in slow motion, a mime slamming a pie into a clown's face. Traditional slapstick. For me, the essence of who the characters are and the reasoning behind it could be humiliation could be um, one-upping someone. See, there's so much. I'm not gonna say exactly what the meaning is, but that is what you're going for. And that is how you make work that withstands time and will be enjoyable on repeat viewings. And that is what I think makes art more important than the average popcorn flick, you know, the summer blockbuster. I think they're fun. I just recently saw, it was the first movie I've seen in like over a year or two in theaters, and it was Godzilla vs. Kong. It's not a well-written movie. It's not fantastic, but by God, it's fun. I had a great time. I laughed the entirety of the film, and it's fun, but there's no substance to it. I won't talk spoilers, but there's a moment where I realize this is outlandish and goofy, and there's, my brain wanted to find a deeper meaning in the movie, and once I saw certain things, I realized it couldn't happen because it was offensive, and it came off as a contradiction to the, the franchise and the title of Godzilla itself, the license and the property was being disrespected if I looked at it with any with any, uh, any vision deeper than the surface what I was being shown. And those movies are fine, they're fun, but there is no lasting impact. If you have a theme the audience can grab onto, peaceful approach to death or of death, again, your interpretation upon your viewing and the time you see it, if you can convey that, that is your goal. I understand I'm repeating myself, but it's important to hammer this in and make this as clear as possible. That is what you are going for as a writer, in my opinion. Now see, with my skeletons, the interpretation is already beginning. So I gave them a, an elongated spine. There was no reason for that. I simply wanted stylistically to do that. My brain said, you're going to make the spine longer than the skeleton. Why? Now they have tails. 
Why? Why do they have tails? Okay, so these are no longer the skeletons of humans. They're the skeletons of something else. Okay, interesting. Juices are flowing. I've gotten the brain thinking. The brain is now awake. So let's really quickly dirty this up because I love how it looks. We're gonna add some more scratches over the rib cage. Make the heads a little bit dirtier. Obscure it, the spine's a little bit worse. And then we'll add some X's for the eyes because they are dead. They are skeletons. Skeletons are not alive. And that's what we have. Draw my skeletons. My brain is happy. And we've gotten the creative thoughts flowing. Now, we move on to writing. And I said that we were gonna be talking about my project Sheol, project title. Um, we're gonna be talking about that in full for sure. However, I did the other day, I was watching a compilation of short horror projects and I actually was inspired in during one of them. It was the Junji Ito collection. And I was inspired to write something. It wasn't even, it didn't have anything to do with the story. The story was of puppets. And the puppets were, it was just people that were puppets. And there was an evil puppet too. And once the evil puppet died, um, the puppets stopped, mo uh, they stopped moving. And that sparked the idea that a cursed object that controls the entirety of someone and their life. And I ran with it. I completely ran with it. And running with an idea is dangerous because if you get attached to an idea that's not very good or it's broken from the start and you didn't know that, um, you can create something and waste a lot of paper and time and thought and energy into something that's not even going to happen. However, if you start out with what we've been talking about, conceptualizing and cementing your theme you can usually carry your concept beyond the running with a cool idea moment and that is very important because that will save a lot of ideas as writing down a cool idea okay I like there's a like there's a frame I, I can see like I there's a mood captured and say there's a parking lot, there's one light beaming down, it's very blue, blue light everywhere, and then there's one orange street light beaming down on a motorcycle. And there's someone walking to the motorcycle from the woods. Interesting. If you try to build off of that, that's kind of it. The freedom is limitless. Freedom is good. But with writing, freedom brings a higher possibility to falter or to hinder the message that you would end up conveying with something. So how do I interpret that? the theme if you just have a cool idea whatever what is the theme it's nighttime what does nighttime represent the motorcycle is clearly of importance why is the motorcycle important to the character he's emerging from the woods symbolically forest can represent in the dream subconscious dream realm um, i've studied 
a fair amount of dream logic and um, metaphorical uh, interpretations of what dream dreams are trying to say through your strange dreams. I ate a koala, what does that mean? It's, everything has a meaning in the subconscious and there's a reason the, the subconscious picks things that it does. Um, so, coming from the woods, regularly in the, in the subconscious mind, dreams represent, or excuse me, forests represent being lost. There's a lack of path and direction. So he's emerging from being lost, could mean many things, literally, figuratively, whatever. And he's returning to his motorcycle which, what does a motorcycle do? It's transportation, it could be, see what I mean? I don't wanna to give too much interpretation because I want you to decipher things on your own as well. And it's super key to find the theme because once you find it, then when you run with an idea, if something no longer works from stage one, you can save it because you have a theme meaning there are other things that can represent the theme of what you want without having the initial concept of what created this in the first place. Do you, you understand? It's very, um, it's complicated and it's very tough to get across. But I, I have a friend right now who, his name's Chase, and I really think that he's doing something correct with a story he's working on. He usually does comedies and skit ideas, but he's, as of now, he's working on a new concept and it has to do with depression. And what he's attempting to do is come up with representation and symbolism for his thematic things in the movie and find purpose for what's happening. That is what you're supposed to do, in my opinion. That is how you create something that has longevity, purpose, and a heart. When you're writing, um, my greatest difficulty is to not overwrite. That is my main issue. When I, as a writer, what I struggle with the most, more than writer's block, which I'm, I'll talk about next, is overwriting and overcomplicating things. So my project, Sheol, there's someone in snow. And I also, for some reason, I wanted there to be essentially two movies going simultaneously. There's the scene of the man in the snowy woods and it cuts to a very, um, how would I describe it? Uh, other than he's, as of now, he's labeled digital slave. The digital slave is in a dark room and he's being watched by the man in the woods who's in the room with him at the same time. And the digital slave is just spouting repeated nonsense and gibberish. My brain took that and says, okay, what does that mean? Why is that there? So I began looking things up, metaphors, symbolism. Why is it snowy? Why is he in the woods? Why is he digitally um, enslaved by... Uh, uh, whatever technology he's using, why? And I over explained everything to myself. I wrote a couple of pages worth of why things were the way they were and I slowly saw myself losing passion, interest, and drive to create this story, which I was initially absolutely dead set on creating. Why? Why did I lose everything upon expanding on the idea? That should get you deeper into it, yes? Occasionally. 
sometimes with avant-garde ideas, you can't do that. Sometimes it is your subconscious and expanding adds an intellectual point that will actually take away the meaning and the significance of the subconscious point. And overthinking, due to my anxiety, overthinking is very much hostile and very much the enemy to my projects as of late. So, sometimes, and I've, I did this with Sheol, I had to go in and scratch out all the depth that I put into it and just get rid of them one by one back until I stripped it down to a man is in snow, a digital slave is in a dark room being interviewed, and the man in the snow is also in this room with him and watching him give answers. And once I brought it back to that, once I reeled the idea back into its core concept and the theme, I'm not telling you the theme, but once I brought it back, simplified it, made it just the theme of the original concepts together, suddenly I'm inspired again. I'm back into the idea, I'm into it. And the inspiration is coming again. And suddenly I can see shots again. I can hear the music. I can see the scenes playing out. I can see when cuts happen in the editing. And it's all very, very clear again after losing it. So when you have your core theme and in your concept and you know what it is and you base your ideas around your theme when you go too far and you veer off in a direction in writing that no longer is beneficial to the story, you will lose interest in it. And once you've lost interest in it, usually I would just scrap the idea and say, well, that was nice while it lasted. Now, I have the theme for my concept. I reel it back just a little bit. Is the theme there? No. Reel it back again. Is the theme here? Here's the theme. It feels good again. Now I can expand in a proper direction. No longer go this way, maybe go this way. And you can save your projects if you have a theme to return to. So when you stray from the path, is this correct? Is this cohesive with what I'm attempting to say? Once you lose what you started, or you veer off from what you started, you try to be more than what you started, you wanna tweak or change what you started, that's when problems arise. Now, I made a film called Karma. It was a crime thriller. It was a drama movie, black and white, mostly improvisational dialogue. Making sure the wind's not too bad on the audio meter. The, um, that movie was, my initial inspiration for that was David Cronenberg's 80s work. It was very sci-fi. The idea was, um, the project title was For a Cigarette Under a Bridge. And the story was of someone who got cigarettes laced with alien chemicals. And it turned into a body horror movie very quickly. Science fiction and all. Very hard sci-fi though. I'm not big of, that much of a sci-fi person. The idea changed entirely and it became a message on a criminal who decides they want to turn their life around but karma takes effect and they are slain in a very similar fashion to how they were killing someone. And that's very different for my initial theme. No body horror, none of that. No science fiction. How did I save the project? How did I change it and continue on with it without it? The core theme. I went back, I backpedaled. This was before I understood how to implement theme in all of this. 
I would go back and I realized I just want to make a movie that gives me personally David Cronenberg vibes. And while the movie is very much, uh, I was on quite a Lars von Trier kick and I needed, I needed to express his camera style and a lot of his gritty um, filmmaking techniques into mine. I just, I needed to do that. And it didn't harm the project itself, so I kept it. And how did I do, how did it work? Why did it work? Science fiction alien cigarettes is very different from a man who is losing his girlfriend because of the choices he's made. How do I, how do, how do those come close to representing each other? Cronenberg. I wanted to make something in the vein of a Cronenberg fashion that gave me the same tone feeling of uh, something tonally that he would have done. But it's no longer the 80s. It's still Cronenberg inspired, but rather than like Shivers or uh, Brood, it was uh, like a history of violence, um, a most dangerous method, and it just took a more sophisticated look, a more psychological look than a science fiction one. The idea is from the start of your idea, establish your theme, and finding your theme is difficult at times. Sometimes the theme isn't even going to work. When that happens, all you have to do is find another one. Find something that inspires you. That's as simple as it is. Just find what inspires you, what speaks to you, what has a voice when you look at it, what says things to you, what expands what idea expands itself for you? It's not so much you're forcing the idea to work, it's what idea willingly opens up for you. With Sheol, the idea is snow. Why is this movie giving me snow? I'm gonna run with it. A man is in a snowy forest. Now I want to add an interview scene. Why is there an interview scene? And I start correlating the two and figuring out why they're together. Why marry these two ideas that want to be married? It's entirely subconscious. And it's okay to look into it. I, like I said, I studied the philosophical side, the dream logic, and like biblical parallels and all sorts of things, storytelling-wise. Because as a writer, I like structure and I like seeing that stuff. Um... But you need to be, give your brain the freedom to explore concepts in depth and to realize that if something no longer works upon learning something, you change it or you backtrack and you make it simplistic again. There's nothing wrong with simplistic. Uh, a concept that is very simple was a man in karma the main character spoiler the main character dies because of karma um, how do you make a man dying complicated he dies simple that's what I showed in the first death he kills someone and they bleed out and die very simple very straightforward how do I complicate it? How do I add depth? How do I add weight? I show what's going through the mind of the second person. When the man who killed somebody dies, I show him his girlfriend. I show him happy memories. I show him his past. I show him things that the audience would remember that were good. And then I add the first murdered victim. Now, you understand, oh, that first character had, he had regrets and moments of deeper thought upon his death as well. A simplistic idea isn't necessarily a bad one. It's how you utilize your themes to expand the simplicity and complicate it.
Now, for something a little bit more easy, a little bit more structured, um, with writing, three acts. I like them. I like three acts. I understand the argument for five acts, but I personally prefer three acts. I think it's more effective, it's more well-rounded, and I'm pretty sure my movie, Sheol, is going to be a short film. I'm pretty positive it's a short film. I can't say for certain, but I think it will be. And a short film dictates a film under, I believe it's 45 minutes in the US. And yeah, so I'm pretty sure it's gonna be a short film. And I like the three act structure. I, I wrote, let me get my notes on my phone. I originally wrote uh, my clown movie. I originally wrote that with a traditional story structure and I did not have fun with it at all. It felt so restrictive. The six stage plot structure. Here is how it works. It's a three act structure. You open the movie with, I just, when I write these, I just have lined paper and I write one, two, three, four, five, six, and then like for one I would say setup, for two I would say opportunity, and so on and so forth. So it's structured, one, setup, two, opportunity, three, new situation, four, change of plans, five, progress, six, point of no return, seven, complications and higher stakes, eight, major setback, nine, final push, 10, climax, 11, aftermath. Now, all of those, if you have a theme carrying it, you can pretty much carry this. So, set up, let's do the teddy bear story again. Set up, there's a teddy bear in a cradle and whoever cradles him is missing. There's a binky on the floor. That's the setup. There's a living teddy bear, there's a pacifier and a missing baby. So, opportunity. The character is going to use this opportunity to take the pacifier and look for the missing baby. He goes walking. New situation. You find that there's no one in the house. He's going through the house and it's just scary. There's nothing anywhere. Change of plans. The way he was going to go. There's a grim reaper playing a piano in the family room. He's not going that way. He finds a bottle in the kitchen now. This is the change of plans. He decides, oh, I should fill the bottle up. Progress. He fills the bottle. This will be, represent some struggles that he has thematically. The, he will take that into the point of no return. He now has a full bottle, a pacifier, and he's in a part of the house that the door behind him has locked itself. Complications and higher stakes. There's other toys, there's other, pa there's other uh, stuffed animals, and they wanna take all of the things from him and bring them to the baby so they become praised, not the teddy bear. Major setback. He spills the bottle and fighting off the teddy bears and the other toys and stuffed animals. Final push. He struggles through. He succeeds. The climax. He battles his way into the parents' bedroom. The aftermath. He finds the baby. He gives him his pacifier and he's cradled again by the baby. That is a very basic writing structure. Now, when I write with avant-garde, writing that way is not fun, for me at least. I struggled, and it was just an absolute grind fest to write that way. It was, I'm glad I did it, and I'm glad I learned how to structure a story in the traditional sense so I have the knowledge, and I know that now. However, I don't think I will ever write that way again. As a more abstract artist, it was a struggle, a grind, and just so restrictive. And you can, by all means, you can take those and place them out of order to kind of puzzle your story, which is fun, that's totally fine. But I... I feel there is, I feel we're locked in, in America at least. European cinema and Eastern cinema definitely has a bit, their eyes are a bit more open than ours are. 
and their their thought process is a bit more it's a bit better while they're very restrictive in some areas um, I think the way that they convey stories is more advanced than what America is putting out and I keep checking the recording by the way I'm just making sure it's very hard to see in this light um, so I would say if this is an early project for you I would suggest writing it in that the six act or the three act six stage plot structure I think that you should attempt to write a story that way simply to do it and once you've done it you will have a mode in your head where you kind of understand the progression and the the drive between behind a story and how it should play out and it will close it will make you a little more close-minded with story because you'll say oh a story should play this way that's the correct way it is dangerous to have that knowledge but I am breaking away from it, so if I can do that, so can you. And my my story for Sheol, right now, let me share it with you very lightly. So with my spine, I, that's what I call my writing. I call the story, like the thing that carries the story, I call it the spine. And my spines have three acts, or three vertebrae, I guess. And within those, I have a few things. So, act one has a few segments that I want to show. And here's the thing you need to know though. If you have a theme that you want to expand on, and I think, I really do think that that is an effective way of storytelling. You have to understand the way a story is told and how information is given to people. So, how does that work? What does that mean? When you first watch a story, you don't know what's going on. And as the movie goes on, it drops bits of information that help you expand the story yourself. And upon the third act, you reach full understanding of the movie. You have all the knowledge that the filmmaker wanted you to have. And that is the mindset. So when you're writing, you write act one with the idea that the audience knows nothing. So, how do you establish the world? How do you establish the characters? Maybe you don't want to, and that's totally valid. That's justified. You don't have to explain anything. In my movie, Sheol, I'm not explaining anything. The way my movie opens, and you don't have to do it this way, this is just guidelines for um, opening your thought process. With Sheol, it opens with a man in the snow and there's someone being interviewed who's a digital slave to technology. And then there is possibly, I'm still unsure if it fits thematically, but as of now there is a God figure and it is simply um, outside the realm of the rest of the movie. So that's a lot of information, and no one knows what's happening with that. So, Act 2. Act 1 is establishing all of those things that I want to show. Act 2 is expanding on them. Act 2 is saying, okay, the man in the snow is doing this. The, the digital slave... Oh, the man in the snow is in the room with the man with the digital slave. Okay, that's expansion. And now the God figure is starting, we realize he's watching them. It's like, oh, expansion. Now, act three, you have all the information needed. Now we bring the ideas home, we conclude them. And again, you don't have to. This is mere suggestion and the direction I'm personally taking. Act three is the viewer has full information of your idea. Now, 
What do you do with it? You conclude. You don't have to. I'm going to conclude. He finds something in the snow. And he uses that something in the snow on the person in the interview. Due to the god figure convincing him to do it. What he finds in the snow represents something else in the interview, which the god figure commands both realms. Now I've tied together all three very separate ideas and made it one unified theme, and it has one message. What the message is to you is not what it means to me. That is the, I think, most effective way for an avant-garde film to tell a, tell a linear story. By withholding information, not being direct, and saying, giving key information to the universe, but not explaining what any of it does or means. That, I think, is the goal. And that, I think, is conceptualizing your themes and the early stages of writing. In the next episode, we'll go more in depth into writing and we will progress the story beyond conceptualization. Thank you for watching.